So I want to start off talking a little bit. Of, this obviously has become one of the most used processes, I guess, if that's what you want to call it, even though Agile was never supposed to be a process. And that's what you'll, you'll hear some of my complaints about Agile as, uh, as I talk about this today, as we go through this. But I also have a lot of good things to say about Agile as well. I just think a lot of people get it wrong. And, and I really like to subscribe to the Agile mindset and the way you think about it. But as Agile, you were trying, one of the big things I think with Agile, one of the one side effects where people really seem to be happy with Agile was, wow, we can go out here very fast. We're really trying to get this accelerated delivery. And, you know, this is a picture I got off of the wiki. <laughs> you, you know, it's an open source picture that you can find. You can find many pictures about what agile development is. And, they, you know, they always talk about some of these values and, and moving along uh, at, at this quick pace and how we can adapt quickly. And we're really trying to focus on customer satisfaction as, as we're doing this stuff. And, in fact, I would even kind of relate it to the the, the Kano model. I don't know if people here have heard of the Kano model. Anybody here? A few people. But it was actually came out in the 80s. And actually, all the Agilists, which a lot, all of most of the, all those people, at, you know, when they wrote the Agile Manifesto, they came from the object-oriented patterns world. And when they met at Snowbird, Utah, in like around 2000, 2001 time period, uh, a lot of them will tell you they were highly influenced by lean. Kanban, TPS type, even though not completely, but that was obviously a high influence. But the Kano model, even in a sense, it was kind of focused on, uh, it's, a, it's really focused on theory of product and development, and it's independent of software, it's anything. And really focused, it was in the 80s by a guy named uh, Noriaki Kano. And it was really focused on classifying customer uh, satisfaction, whether we've been successful with this, the execution, how well it went and things along that. And, and you could think of Agile kind of somewhat fitting a lot of this, even though a lot of Agile a lot of times gets into how fast were we, how fast was the execution, was the customer happy as we went, things along that line. So I think this model actually addresses some other axes that a lot of times your Agile people or the, all my Agile friends that I know don't necessarily focus on. And one of the problems with, the, with Agile is, is as you're going along with Agile, architectural quality can be invisible at times, you know, especially when you're really focusing on just feature, featureitis. Okay, what's the next feature? Let's get the storyboard. The product owner is really focused on uh, putting on the backlog the, the different types of tasks that we want to develop on, but it's always, you know, w w what's the main features? And a lot of times there's some, some hidden features that, as you guys all know about, <laughs> that can get overlooked. So early on, you can get a lot of successes. We're getting out there, oh, cool. It's, it kind of meets the requirements that we're looking for. It's moving along. But how is it going? And so we're, we're developing and we're going along. You know, we have these different features or the new business we're trying to get into. We're doing experiments. We, we need to get into the mobile area or try some different e-biz. But the problem is, is as we go along, the solution can become, you know, quite this bigger thing. Because we start out with these successes, but then all of a sudden, maybe we're in a regulated industry and there's other things going on. Maybe there's security or reliability or other things. So really, what's below the waterline to keep this system going? What, what is part of this whole big system? And there's a lot of these illities that you hear people talk about. But to me, they're still features. They're important features. If security is a requirement, some people like to call them non-functional requirements. And okay, I'm okay with that, but I've always said if the requirement is a requirement, uh, if you have to be secure, you have to be reliable. <laughs> but, and, but this is an important part of the, the architecture. And some of these types of illities sometimes are uh, they're conflicting each other. You can think of usability and security as a good example that a lot of people like to talk about, is if you want a system real usable, don't tie people's hands and always logging in and doing all this extra checks and all these other things with it. On the other hand, we have to balance it. If you need security, you're dealing with banking or medicine or whatever. I don't want people to get my credit card information. I need to, to be thinking about that. And also that can start affecting how, how fast we can go and we can sustain it. And in fact, it was kind of nice to have see here Chris this morning take care of the first part of my talk for me. Because a lot of what Chris 
talked about this morning was really focusing on as you're going with this, you know, what, what, how can you actually continue to move fast? And there's certain illities, you know, so certain things that can affect our architecture, which can have a really drastic effect on what we do. And, uh, and especially when we were looking at things like maintainability or testability or deployability. In fact, that's one of the things I always liked about, uh, I, I've been looking at some agile architecture patterns and also looking at TDD type things, is it's good to develop your architecture so that it's testable. <laughs> and if you think that, it'll influence how you design your architecture. And if we're thinking about that ahead of time, it can really have good long-term effects on how we evolve the system. If we ignore a lot of these things and we're just going on with the blind agile, we got our agile blinders on, and we, we learned agile by what all the big vendors are selling us, and ooh, if you buy our product and you follow Scrum exactly like this, you're being agile. Sorry, you have to do your stand-ups exactly like this and say this. Uh, and, and sometimes, you know, that's, agile was never supposed to be a process. But a lot of times, people get stuck in the process. Agile has a pro you have different processes to help you be agile. And, and there's nothing wrong with having a process. Pe you know, people that talked about agile weren't against process. But they were really focused on doing what's best for what we're doing. So if we're writing software that has to be uh, a rocket ship to Mars or whatever, that's going to have quite a different way that we're going to have to develop that than if I'm doing Joe's online coffee shop with I want to sell some things from my coffee shop, coffee cups and things like that. And, you know, it's not going to be so catastrophic if the order didn't quite go through. <laughs> Whereas if, you know, if it's a rocket to, to Mars, it'll have quite an effect. And in fact, we can, we can be moving along fine and we're thinking we're going really well. And next thing we know, whoa, you know, we can't, uh, you know, the, the product owner was talking to the development team wow, these features that I'm giving you just look just like the ones I gave you three or four months ago. You were able to implement those very quickly. Now you're telling me it's going to take two or three sprints? You were able to do twice as many of these in one sprint. Like, what's going on? <laughs> well, now the architecture is starting to grow, and uh, that, that was, uh, you know, all of a sudden there's more team people involved, and, and trying to sustain that can become a problem. And, and in fact, there's a lot of myths associated with Agile, and I, I put up agilemist.com. I've been having fun with this. Uh, you can help subscribe to more if you've got some good suggestions for it. But and we have uh, some different ones online, but I kind of outlined a few of them here is, a lot of times it's like, ooh, we can always go fast if we're doing Agile. Well, you can go fast, but, but what do you mean by going fast? Is it really fast that, I mean, we can go through, write a lot of code. You can go fast to a ball of mud, right? <laughs> Um, and we can get a lot of work done. I could show the boss I did a lot, of, a lot of story cards, but did those really add value to what the business needed at the end, and did it really address the needs that we needed for releasing the software? Um, and, ooh, we can make, don't worry about the architecture. Oh, I, that always drives me crazy when I hear that with a lot of the Agile people. It'll just magically emerge. Well, yeah, it'll emerge. Something will emerge, but it may not be what you want. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, and there's this balance of what to do with that. And some architecture changes, and I've had to deal with this. I've had to add security late in the game. Uh, you know, I was in the research environment. We were real successful, so all of a sudden, you know, we were doing, so I had some Caterpillar-sponsored research, and we were real successful with this financial modeling system, and now they wanted it in production. They were so happy with it. And so then I had to refactor the system to add security in. And, in fact, because of that, I wrote the first security patterns not because I'm a security expert, but it talked about the challenges that I had when we had to all of a sudden evolve this system for doing that. Uh, and if we had known that security was, a, you know, one of those important things, we could have addressed it at a more appropriate time, and it wouldn't have had, a, it wouldn't have tore up the system so much as we did that. Fortunately, we had the time to kind of do the proper refactoring. Unfortunately, most people don't. And in fact, if we don't deal with a lot of this, we still up, uh, end up with something that Bill talked about that I talked about at Saturn back in 2011, I believe it was called the big ball of mud architecture. And I actually looked online just to remind myself because I said, wow, it's been about 20 years since I wrote this paper with my good friend Brian Foote, <laughs> my colleague. And, you know, it's back in the, the big oops pattern days in the late 90s. And it was 1998, actually, uh, when, or 97 when we actually wrote the paper and then it got published in 98. So it has been 20 years, so that was kind of scary. It's like, wow, that's a long time. But we were really, at that time, Brian and I, because we came from the software architect group, 
And we were really looking at what makes good architecture. How can you get reused? What are good frameworks? What are good patterns? We, we, we were really looking at what makes for good design. But lo and behold, we noticed that a lot of successful systems are not like this. Now, does anybody know what this is a picture of? This over here? If, if Paulo was here, I would not let him answer. Brazil. Yes, it is. OK. So pa Paulo, since he lives there, I would not let him answer that. But that is Brasilia. And actually, we, we reference this in our big ball of mud paper, is it's a city by design, like Washington, DC. Most cities are not. Like you think of Paris or Denver, they kind of start off with maybe some kind of vision, but then they kind of organically grow. Even this city is a city by design. It took a life of its own after it happened. In 1950, they decided to move the capital. And, and, and they had a lot of regulations on what can be done in certain parts of the city. And in fact, you know, there's a very famous Brazilian architect, Niemeyer, and he did a lot of interesting architectures in this, in this city, plus in other areas as well. And in fact, there's a picture uh, of, uh, you, you know, one of the national museums. Is, and there in the background is the National Library here, and you can kind of walk underneath it. And I w when I w I, lo and behold, about five years ago, I gave a talk about big balls of mud in Brazil at a big software engineering conference. And so it was kind of, it was like 15 years after uh, we had written the paper. So it was, it, was, it was kind of a reminder of that. And being in Brasilia, since we had mentioned Brasilia, and I had no idea when we wrote the paper that I'd ever be in Brazil, let alone Brasilia, uh, for that. And we were talking about that. And, I, and so I started touring around, and I went into the National Library. And I'm like, okay, these, some of these architectures are cool, but this building's kind of interesting, but... Where are all the books? There were no books in the National Library. And so I asked, curiosity, and they said, well, the way the building is designed, it could not handle the stress load if we filled this library up with books. Now, have you seen any software projects like that maybe at times? Where you know, we, we had, the architect had something in mind, but by the time we got around implementing it, maybe we looked over that, that kind of feature. Now, he was interested in what looks cool and got this cool effect, and he, and he did some nice things with that, but you also have to make sure that it's going to meet some of these other kind of requirements. Now, maybe this guy was such a forward thinker that now they've started putting e-books in here. Maybe he was designing for the future. Possibly. I, I kind of doubt that back in 1950, but... <laughs> Uh, po po possibly that's, that's what was going on. But why is this? So me and Brian, this, we don't look at this as an anti-pattern. We look at this as a pattern. Sometimes there's good reason why you get a little bit of a mess. Even as you're cooking or building something, you make a little bit of mess. But the problem is, is if it comes too bad. So why is it this is Frank Lloyd Wright, mile high, proposed in Chicago. They never built it because they couldn't quite get the space. You would have had to have a couple square miles <laughs> of land to really build what they wanted to build here. But why, why, why do our architectures, that, that what we're preaching, but what we end up with, look more like shanty towns at times? And what leads to that? And, and may, in fact, maybe Agile was a little bit of an answer to this. You know, why, why is it that we have these, these uh, spaghetti code, the spaghetti code jungle, globals everywhere? You know, every time you have a new feature, we're just adding a new parameter with a new case statement. You know, let's add a new if on it or whatever. Why does that happen? Uh, and and why, why don't we end up with such nice architectures? Why do these ha still thrive and succeed in a lot of ways? And in fact, you might ask, maybe this has gone away. This is an old paper. But I was really shocked and surprised that a friend got a hold of me and said, Joe, your big ball of mud paper last fall was mentioned in the Financial Times, you know, by Lisa Polak. And she's a technical writer at the Financial Times. And, um, and she really talks about the fact that big balls of mud are still here thriving and how, how this could really cause a lot of problems. So how can we deal with that? And in fact, a lot of stuff that Brian and I was originally talking about, sometimes people misunderstood our ideas. They thought we were saying, well, we're stuck with big balls of mud. We might as well just live with it or let's just build big balls of mud. We were never promoting that. We were saying, let's accept the reality that muddy stuff happens at times. Sometimes there's good reasons for it. And maybe if we can deal with it, we can find ways to escape the spaghetti code jungle and evolve to a much better architecture from that. 
Uh, and in, more recently, I've been doing some work with Rebecca Wurzbrock where we're talking about some patterns for sustaining your architecture. There's some things, there's even some preventative maintenance type things you can do to help keep things clean. And a lot of that that might lead to this, I'm not going to talk a lot about the Kinevin framework. I, I know somebody yesterday did a, a very interesting talk, including some information about it. But I think it's, inter it's, it's good to know that this, this is a good model that I have appreciated that helps me understand what's going on. Uh, and, and the main thing, this is broken into these four categories about obvious or complicated or complex or chaotic. And if you're in a chaotic area, well, anything goes. So hopefully we're not working in that area. <laughs> but sometimes you are. You're in there, you're trying something, and maybe an earthquake happens or something that tears your whole business up and it's, it's chaos and you're just trying to do whatever. Um, this is when we know a well-known practice. It's, we can almost assembly line it. <laughs> uh, it. Definitely in the manufacturing world that happens a lot. But most of the time, most of us in the software world with more of our interesting projects, we're really focusing on the top two parts of this, the complicated and the complex. So this could be like, you can think of a Ferrari car, it could be very complicated to how you assemble it, but it's pretty well known. We can really still work out the complications and train people from that. Complex can be where we're really doing experiments, trying to figure out new business areas. We, something, so we might be trying some spike solutions and a couple other things, doing a little research, and we want to fail quickly, but the things that are successful we bring back in and then hopefully move into that. The problem I think a lot of times with when I'm working with people and how to, I'm a consultant and work out with a lot of different companies that I see is people don't know what area they're in and what area you're in, different, you should use different practices. And you need to think about your architecture quite differently. And so it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a model and, and I can't do it justice. You can go online and find a lot of very good talks and descriptions and documentation about the Kinevin framework. Um, that, that, that describes it. Uh, I, I do have a link off here on, on some of this, but if you just Google it, you'll find a lot of really good information on, on this framework. But, but it's good to kind of know where you're going on. And a lot of times with what we're going, we're going back and forth. And knowing when we're in one area, but we're experimenting out another, that there's a different mindset and different ways we need to address architecture or even the ways we're doing our practices and the way the teams are set up can have a different thing effect on us. And if we, if we think about this, it might help us. Mostly is how can we, as we're evolving and we're trying to sustain it and not trying to hit that big ball of mud, how can we be more confident? So one thing I really want to do is focus on how can I be confident? You know? So I definitely want, I want Linda, it, you know, if, if I was developing for her, to her team and she, I want her to give me the thumbs up. She's feeling good about what we're doing and feel that we can make the changes and we have that confidence level of what's going on with that. And, and, and so how can I do that? How could I convince, say I'm working for Linda's team, how could I do that? How can I adapt my, and, and be able to develop this system, still sustain it being fast, but being able to, to, to re keep the confidence level that you know the system's not gonna all of a sudden hit a brick wall or I can't change it quickly and I'm still meeting you know, a lot of those important entities that we have to address in the architecture. Well, I believe, I'm a strong believer of this, values drive my practices. So, for example, I have a lot of musician friends, one right here, but I have a lot of others as well. If, and depending on what they value, it depends on how they practice. So if you really value, I, I know how to play a saxophone, I know how to read music, but since, since that's not my high value, I'm not practicing a lot. <laughs> so there, in fact, I haven't played the saxophone, even though I got two saxophones, I haven't played it for years. So therefore, even though I kind of know the fingerings and the notes, I would have trouble blowing and <laughs> getting my lips quite right from the saxophone. So depending on what I value and what, the t what, what values happen across the team, so an organization has values, a team has values, but individuals have values as well. And you kind of have to, map all those and kind of get a little bit of consistency. So if I'm on a team, it's good for me to know your personal values, but also then the team needs to come and have what its set of values are. And so if we're on an agile team, it's important to think about what our values are. So this, this had this odd set of values up there. <laughs> and it seems like the main value with this was going fast, right? Now they did have things like transparency and simplicity, but I think, 
even though a lot of people from the early Agile days and a lot of the people that were part of the, you, you know, the signatures on the Agile manifesto, I think they were all very good architects and understand things well. And it was all more implicit to them. There's a lot of implicit values that they talked about that a lot of times the rest of the world misses. Like quality software is important. Obviously, customer satisfaction is key. That should be a key value. But there's other values. Can we sustain this? Is it dependable? Is it reliable? You know, there might be things like, is it a positive, happy team? Now, a happy team is, doesn't necessarily guarantee success. We, we've seen both sides of that. But it can definitely make a difference. Are you even going to keep the good people? Uh, wh what are we doing there from that? And can we maintain it? And so there's probably a lot of other values or a lot of other possible uh, things that we can work on visibility. So when we're looking at values, you know, I think it's good to think about what are our agile, if we're trying to be agile or lean or as we're developing, what are our design values? So the design team may have values. The product owners may have their set of values. The company may have a values along with individual. But one thing is, this seems to be a core part of values that you see a lot, is things like design simplicity, quick feedback, frequent releases, teamwork and trust. Obviously, we want to satisfy the customer's requirements on what we're doing. But in addition to that, I think there's this, we want to learn. We want to build quality software. Most software engineers I know like building quality software, even though that sometimes they get stuck and they feel like they're in a trap putting out fires all the time. Uh, but they're doing so-called agile stuff. And so th these are a couple of important things. And what I think is key to that is this, we want to be able to sustain things and keep learning. And so I want to talk, if we value this, and what are some practices that we can take to help us evolve this? What are some small steps that we can take? And in fact, part, one thing that was supposed to be part of Agile, and, and, and Norm Kurth in the old days wrote a book on it, and Linda Rising talks about it a lot with retrospective type things. What's core uh, to, to a lot of this is to learn and adapt and do what's best for the people working with it. That gets overlooked a lot. So I want to go through some different practices, including some different uh, th things to think about architecture. And some of these might seem obvious uh, to some things that you should do, but some other ones I'm hoping to challenge you on. And, and once again, I'll encourage you to interrupt me at any time, and I'll, I'll make sure to take some times in between to do some of that as we got plenty of time here. So one thing that I have found key that Agile does promote and value is delivery size. So when people are looking at Agile, in the old days we used to, we might go months or years. I remember in, in the 90s talking to somebody from a Japanese company and he would talk about they would, they would spend a year or more doing analysis before any piece, of so any piece of code was ever written trying to understand. And it was kind of back to what we used to call analysis paralysis is they, did, they didn't get any feedback or experiment or have the feedback loop, but they were, trying, they were trying to do the right thing. They were trying to understand the problem well and do what they could. And then they would spend a huge effort implementing, and then they would implement something. It might be kind of messy or whatever. And in fact, I asked them, I said, well, what happens when you get to the implementation and it doesn't meet you, you know, all your architectural diagrams and things like that? Well, uh, it's just got to, or it doesn't matter this is what the description is, and <laughs> the software just needs to meet that. But it didn't really allow a lot of room. One of the things that, that Agile was focused on is let's do a little bit of inspect and adapt. Let's make sure we're on course. Let's keep getting feedback, including to the architecture, and let's even adapt the system. Not only the code, the code base obviously is the, what is actually the instance of the, the living architecture. I mean, I can have all the pretty pictures I want, like the boxes and diagrams, as Chris talked about this morning. But they don't run. Ultimately, the software has to reveal what's going on. And so we can get that as we're going along that. And one thing we've really learned with delivery size is large delivery size can potentially have some issues. Obviously, I might be able to develop more, but we're not getting the feedback, so there's a lot of more potential bugs. And, and it's, so therefore, I have a slower adjust time. By the time we figure out that 
okay, this has issues, and now the customer looks at it, and I know that's what I said, but really, could you change this a little bit? Well, if we would have had that feedback a month earlier, it, would have, it wouldn't have affected the architecture a lot. We had evolved and built a lot of extra stuff in the architecture for that. And also, it's, it's, it's harder to experiment. And plus, since the po potential, the problems are a lot bigger, bugs can take a long, much longer time to fix with that. So it's, it's, it's hard to do the inspecting of DAC. So it's good to have the small, fast feedback loops, um, which you, you happen, it's easier to do with smaller delivery size. And then we can uh, adjust our architecture as, as we go. And plus getting the feedback is, is this working? We can try a more, lot more little experiments. Let's try the spike solution. Maybe there's a risky thing from an architectural perspective, and we want to go off and try this, this new type of technology for our microservices. Let's go experiment with that, try this on the next sprint, come back and try a couple things maybe, and then merge back in and make decisions on that. So going along with small deliveries and quick feedback, uh, we, we can break things down with this. And so then we can stay focused on the things that have the most value and, and the most important things, not only from the customer's perspective, but from the architecture's perspective as well. And in fact, I'm hoping that if we do this, that I can get thumbs up. I, I don't know yet whether I'll get thumbs up from Linda, but knowing my good friend Kevlin, I definitely would have thumbs up with him on this, because <laughs> uh, he comes from kind of this world where, where, we, where, where we live in very similar worlds, him and I do. So I definitely have a, 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 a thumbs up from Kevlin. I'll have to talk more with Linda about some of her thoughts on this as well. And in fact, you could even think, what's going on with microservices architecture with what we had to, heard today is, doing exa is moving exactly towards that place. This, develop these smaller little pieces and have an architecture. So it's an architectural style. Of course, now there's trade-offs, as we heard Chris talk about. You still might have a lot of infrastructure, and it can create a lot of complexity. By the way, I'm not very happy with this picture, OK? But the problem is I've had, and maybe some of you can help me, is I have not been able to find a good picture that properly uh, reflects microservices, even if it's an analogy, it doesn't have to be, it could be a technical picture, but it could be some houses and, or kids or whatever. But how can you swap things in and replace it and there's not so much tightly coupling? But in, in all the Googling I've done or all the thoughts I've done and talking with friends of mine, I have not been able to come up with a good picture. So I, I definitely would welcome anybody if, if, they, if they could envision, even if you have an idea, because I have an artist friend, and I would gladly have, uh, pay her to have her help me draw up something with it. But I'm looking for an idea. How could I really represent microservices? So if anybody has ideas on that, you do have one. All right. Put like a magnifying glass on the top of it. On the top of your gears. <laughs> a magnifying glass on the top of my gears. At the, looking at the surface. Okay. Like yeah. But then that might be kind of cool. So that from that micro, that's kind of cool. The main thing, though, is I don't want to show the interlocking so much, or I want to show that you can swap them in and out and stuff like that. But I do like that microscope. So no matter what I do, I'll have kind of a microscope from the micro type. Yeah. That's showing it there. That's kind of cool, because this like looks it. really big, doesn't it, when you look at this picture. So that would show that it's smaller, but you got the microscope. So that's kind of cool. But I'm trying to also think that the gears and stuff like that itself on top of that. So if anybody has any of that, feel free to email me or send me a message or tweet me or what, what, whatever works. I don't care what technology you use. But the nice thing is with microservices, I was glad to hear Chris today validate that you know, some of the small stuff, it really kind of meets. Uh, it's addressing some of the illities when you're doing microservices architecture. Uh, you still have challenges. It's not a silver bullet. And there's sometimes where the small monolith, whatever small monolith, might ha be the way to go, but I really loved his story talking about the fact that small monoliths have a tendency to grow to large monoliths, and I've seen it happen many, many times. So, for example, about 10 years ago, a friend of mine that was working at a pretty large Silicon Valley company that probably all of you use the software of, probably one of the biggest messy things that I've ever looked at before, they had called me in because I'm from the refactory. 
we know refactoring. You know, we'd kind of come up, and the group I'm with wrote the first commercial refactoring tools. And so they were looking at, they have a ball of mud. And I came in, and this, this company had a single C++ class that was close to a million lines of code. Yeah. <laughs> but this company was being very successful. It's called PayPal. They were ultimately were forced to refactor it. I mean, I can talk about it because they talked about it, plus I signed no NDAs with them. So I decided, and I, I asked them, I didn't, I didn't help them refactor it. It was too scary, C++, first of all, let alone uh, a million lines of, uh, you know, and I asked them how that happened. You know, they were asking me how to refactor it, and I said, very carefully. <laughs> the, uh, but a small piece at a time, ultimately they were forced to, just because even opening the editors and things like that on it was very difficult uh, <laughs> with that. But, but it really happened kind of, uh, it, it, it was kind of organically. They started off really small. It was like a small monolith being very successful. They were a company growing very quickly. So they did the natural thing. They're hiring different people. Ooh, Joe, you want to work for us? Okay, fine. Joe, we've trained you. Now you must add these new features. Prove yourself. But guess what? You better not break anything. And this, this is core to the system. But we want you to add something kind of like what Paulo wrote here, you know, last six months ago, but he's on vacation now or left the, left the company or moved up or whatever, went over to Google and did whatever. And so, but don't break it or you'll get fired. So what do I do? It's kind of like what Paulo did, but I don't want to break what Paulo did. I copy what Paulo did. And I paste it and I put my name on it, version 0 0.9. You know, and so I do the first thing any good programmer would do, right, developer. So I don't break what he did and then I kind of hack it working closely with the people, and I get it kind of working, I show the boss, see, it does it, and look, it didn't break anything else. And it becomes like a cancer inside this, the architecture. And it starts, and I never really understood the system. I'm the new guy. I'm trying to understand it, and then I was never given time to really clean it up and move all that back into the main part of the architecture. So it can really cause a lot of problems with the system as you go. Um, and there was another company down in Brazil, their equivalent of PayPal Brazil. I'll leave the company unnamed. I'm doing some work with them now, but they have the similar problem of success. It's not quite so bad, but you know, a couple million lines of Java code, but that was kind of interesting. But I mean, they started off with just a couple scrum teams, then they were up to seven, now they have 40 some scrum teams on this product. So it was kind of like what Chris was talking about today. 29 scrum teams are dedicated to the core part of this. Core, and, and it's in the, fine, you know, it has to do with financials, regulations, so there's a lot of important types of attributes security, reliability, you got to, you know, you're dealing with people's money. <laughs> so, so it's very important with that. So issues can happen if, if you go along. So it's important to think about quality because it's really, I really believe, you know, I could easily come in and, you know, they've hired me to help them. First, I overviewed their teams and, and looked at some of their agile processes. And we, they need to make that better because Conway's law was going into effect a lot. And it would be easy for me and somebody like John Brandt to come in and let's refactor it. And we got a lot of expertise for rewriting and making the system much cleaner. But if they keep doing what they're doing, <laughs> lo and behold, a year or two later, the same thing would happen. So you have to kind of mix things up differently. And so if you want to have quality, how can we get quality? So how can we evolve it and keep things focused on good quality? So have you ever looked at something, some software, and it's the architecture or the code or whatever. And in fact, in the, ref in the refactoring book that Martin Fowler did, he has a chapter in there that he did with um, uh, Kent Beck and Ward Cunningham with some code smell type things that they had done where they listed a lot of that. But a lot of times this could happen, so it depends on what you value. So neglect can be contagious. And they've even proven this in, like in, in neighborhoods, for example. If in your neighborhood, if I live in a neighborhood where nobody cares and they don't take care of their yard, it, it gets worse and worse. If broken windows uh, are happening, nobody mows their, their yard, for example, next thing you know, the whole neighborhood is starting to look exactly like that. But fortunately, the opposite is true. So for example, with a lot of the code that I was looking at recently that I was talking about, the new people come in and they seem that every time there's a new feature, what we do is we add a new parameter and add a new case statement. Well, I'm the new guy. I'm learning from the experienced guys. If that's what people are valuing, then I become part of that. Whereas if the team doesn't, if the team says, no, we don't tolerate this, we don't want these 500 line or 1,000 line methods. 
We want, you know, if, if we have, we need to rethink this. Maybe we need to pass a parameter object in. Maybe we can use some other good design principles that we've learned. And, and so that can really affect things. And so, and, and it's worth thinking about how should we clean things. And the reason I use this picture is I have a friend of mine that's, he, he's a chef and a very good chef. I mean, actually, uh, he was living out by Bethesda at one point. <laughs> And uh, then he came to Illinois uh, for family reasons and stuff, and uh, had, get, had been written up for a, a restaurant, you know, a, a five-star restaurant he had there in Washington, D.C. But one thing I really learned from him as a master chef is you're going to make a little bit of mess as you're cooking. And I always loved going over to his house as he's cooking. I should have a picture of my good friend David. I should have ca captured some while he was cooking. But as he's cooking, you know, he's making mess, but he's constantly doing a little bit of cleanup as he's going. And it makes a huge difference. Otherwise, your kitchen will get to the effect where it'll cause a lot of problems. So if we don't clean it up as we go, it can become quite an effort to, to, to evolve from that. And in fact, ultimately, it can lead to what commonly we all know, this famous term coined by Ward Cunningham back in the 90s called technical debt. And really, it's when you, you, you have this type of debt that's piled up, continually implementing without going back and reflect your new understanding. And it can really have some long-term costs and consequences if we're not addressing it. Now, I've learned in life that sometimes a little bit of debt is okay. It makes sense. We're trying a spike solution. We're experimenting. It's causing a little bit of a mess. I had to borrow some money to buy my house. A little bit of debt, but as, as we found out, especially here in the U.S., bad debt isn't such a good idea, right? <laughs> you can have uh, banks too big to fail, and then... That can cause a lot of, that can have some very negative consequences with that. So a little bit of debt's okay, but you want good debt and you have to pay back the debt. And, and, and the clean architecture and clean code doesn't happen, just happen, you have to really think about it. Uh, I like this little quote here from Martin Fowler that any fool can write, you know, code that a computer can understand, but really I'm trying to write, if, if I'm in there developing software, I have to think about what I can, you know, if, can I even understand it a week or two later after I've written it? And part of that, it has to come back to a professional commitment. We have to craft it, think about it, and constantly be focused on it. And part of that, refactoring was a big part of that. Here's, Ralph Johnson actually has the first published paper with the term refactoring back in the late 80s. I believe it was, uh, it was, it was probably a, a OOPSA paper, but the first PhD was done by Bill Opdyke and with Ralph Johnson at the University of Illinois. Um, and then follow up by uh, Don Roberts, and then Don Roberts and uh, John Brandt wrote the first commercial refactoring tools. But refactoring was a, a way to evolve your architecture. Now, the problem is, and even Bill talked about this, because Bill's worked on some very large systems, if you're not keeping things cleaned up, large refactorings can be very challenging to completely restructure your architecture, or if you have to go to something new <laughs> because, you know, that architecture is no longer being supported. Uh, but, but technically, when you really look at the definition of refactoring, and since we got to define it, or, you know, actually, uh, Bill and Ralph actually did the early definition. They called it behavior-preserving programming transformations. That means however the, the system behaved before, it's supposed to behave exactly the same afterwards, which means if timing is an issue, an important consideration, if you had bugs before, you're supposed to have bugs after. Right? <laughs> now, you almost always, I never refactor just to keep it the same. Usually, I'm almost doing two things at the same time. But technically, when you refactor, first you restructure it to a, be to a better system. Maybe you add a new layer in. Maybe you're using layered architecture, so you move stuff into this layer. And so you're separating things out. You make sure the system still performs the same way as it did before. And then you start adding your new features or fixing the bugs and stuff like that. Uh, one thing I was really happy with with Agile, and especially since Martin's a, Martin Fowler is a good author and good promoter, is he really promoted that refactoring and testing is a good thing. So in a lot of the Agile processes, they've really focused on that. Now, there's really two types of refactoring types that people look at. One is floss refactorings, where you frequently take care of things. But uh, there's this other one called root canal refactorings, whereas if you put things off. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I don't, which one of these would you prefer? <laughs> Now, I have learned, even in life, even in personal life, no matter how much flossing you do, you still may occasionally have to have a root canal, but, but you'll have a lot less of them. Same way with our software. And in fact, 
uh, th this is based upon a lot of research in industry that where these were uh, Emerson, Murphy Hill, and Andrew Black actually looked at a lot of people in the industry with, with refracting tools, and they even put down what the most common ones that are done, and and, and it's it's important to kind of look at them regularly, and so one thing I've learned is it's good to, if you value clean architecture and clean code, it's good to push in the team to look at that. In fact, you may even have tools, some ways of inspecting and adapting to, as you go. And so I get overwhelmed sometimes when I look at the big list by, in Martin Fowler's book <laughs> from, the, uh, from Ward's wiki that Kent Beck in, had done originally. So I put together my top 10 list, right? Uh, you know, I, I, uh, we, maybe 10 is too many. But I used to watch the David Letterman show a lot. You know, they'd have the top 10 type things. But, you know, uh, th in fact, there's been some research that's even shown things like the way you lay code out and the way you, that way we can even inspect it and understand it can help reduce bugs a lot, even from that perspective. Let alone, some, some of these are related to, uh, since it was written around the object time, not functional programming as much, even though functional programming was also going on. But this was popular back when, when they wrote the wrote the book, but feature envy, for example, or inappropriate intimacy. Um, but being a computer science, I figured I better add one more. <laughs> start, because I don't know whether to start with zeros or ones, but magic numbers are always one as well. And one thing, I'm always blown away when I go uh, uh, out and do consulting and meet with different people, is how many people are afraid to do some of what I call safe refactorings. All I think sometimes people don't feel empowered to do that. The team members are not actually feel like, can I really extract a method? Extract method never breaks anything. I take one method and break it into a smaller piece. Uh, more, in fact, usually you can make it more testable by doing that. Um, now, when you're trying to evolve architectures, there's some more advanced refactoring that you need a lot more testing. And if you have a, a legacy system and you're working with a big ball of mud, you can do like what Michael Feathers talks about with some of the practices. You find design seams and find ways to evolve it, but mostly we try to make it so it doesn't get worse. But the main thing is, is all people should feel safe to do, especially the top uh, five of those, rename, especially a lot of times, and depending on what language we work on, will never break anything. You know, if you're in a very dynamic language and you're using reflection a lot, you have to be maybe concerned with it a little bit. <laughs> but you have ways of testing for that, and you can still have a delicate method to test for it to keep it running as you figure out logging if there is another place doing it. But extract method, interface, or push up. And so this is something to do that. But what's key to this is you must always test. Now, obviously, this is something that Kent Beck would give me the thumbs up for. Yes? Oh, so pull up and push down from the, in the object-oriented thing is, say you have, maybe, oh, let me give you an example. Maybe we have a person and we have both doctors and nurses and, and maybe patients. And doctors and nurses are both medical professions, and they all have a name. So rather than duplicate the name attribute below, you can pull up that. And same way, maybe you have similar functions that are almost doing the same thing. You can just move those up the hierarchy. And then you, you overwrite the differences in the subclasses or delegate off some of those differences. And push down is maybe you push down the differences. <laughs> and so this is, that's kind of unique to object-oriented thinking. With functional, you would have a different types of refactoring, refactorings with, with functional from that. So testing is key. Uh, TDD may, is part of that, but that's not good enough, as, as you all know <laughs> very well. TDD is not sufficient, but part of TDD should also be, and I, I, I've worked with Rebecca Wurstbrock, and we've really been promoting more of a pragmatic approach to TDD, where TDD isn't just blindly writing unit tests. It's much more. You have to think of all the whole type of perspective and how to do that. Ultimately, one nice thing is like what Martin Fowler is, is quoted as saying, I have him here as, as a quote from Martin, is the common wisdom he has is, is if you do this regularly, we, we shouldn't set aside large amounts of time just to do a huge set of refactorings. Is we should really kind of, you know, uh, is focus on uh, keeping things clean as we go. But unfortunately, a lot of times, we have a problem with that. We don't have time. P people don't, aren't giving us the time. We're putting fires out. We're, we're being agile. We have too many story points that we have to try to implement during this next sprint. 
and, and we're, we're getting near the end. We're frantically trying to get in, and, and uh, you know, we're not giving the breathing time to, to kind of clean things up. The boss is breathing down our neck. We have to have these extra features in. But, you know, really, why can't we put it off till the next release? That was supposed to be more the agile mindset, right? But then you get forced to, no, it must go out with this release. Well, we have problems. So then, being good engineers, people, we do what it takes. We work real hard and hack real hard. We put it out there hoping that we can clean that up after that sprint. But lo and behold, the next sprint comes, and it starts becoming part of what we value and part of the culture. So how can we deal with this? So one thing we, uh, I've learned that works well, and it's, it's a key, key principle, which I think belongs to the Agile mindset, is pause points. So having a little bit of time to stop, reflect. If we're always putting fires out and we never have a chance, uh, we don't know if we're going to make things better or not. And in fact, in the 1800s, Doctors found this out. So, you know, um, back in the 1800s, it used to be the practice that if maybe you all of a sudden we had a lot of patients, um, as the patients were coming in, we didn't find there, there was, wasn't enough time to even wash our hands. and they, they didn't even have the practice of cleaning up in between. It's like, oh, we have to see the next patient. But the, the mortality rate was... Uh, in the 19th century, it's common for a doctor just to move directly over. And, and basically, they started, uh, they, know, they noticed the high mortality rate. So Dr. Ignaz Samela was from, uh, even though he's originally from Germany, but he wasn't in Germany at the time w when this is done. But, he, but he, he, he wanted to experiment with making sure that everybody washed their hands with this, this kind of chlorine solution in between all the patients. And he noticed that that they, they went from losing about 20% of the patients down to about 2%, <laughs> a huge change. So even taking that little bit of time had a drastic effect on the fact that, yeah, maybe we see just a couple less patients, but guess what? A lot more of them survive. And so the, similarly in our software, you know, this, this is an important type of consideration. We have a professional responsibility yeah, and most people in this room know that well, because that's why you're at Saturn. But a lot of times getting it into even this, everybody, it's a whole team. Everybody on the team should be responsible for quality. I shouldn't just leave it up to the, the way that the, the, the architect is describing it versus the QA is going to find it. The whole, it should be a whole team mentality. And so we really need to make it a professional responsibility that that we're all working on. If I'm working on the system, if I break it, I fix it. In fact, I like to call it, the reason I have the picture of the Boy Scouts up here is, is it, we call it kind of like the Boy Scouts model. If I go out camping, I make sure to clean up after myself. That's what you learn. You're supposed to, you know, you learn all this. And you not only learn that, you learn that, hey, if there's a little bit of other mess that somebody left, it takes really, literally, hardly any extra energy to go ahead and do that. And the causal effect of that continuing on has a huge impact on making things better. Now, I don't go around the whole campground necessarily and try to clean up the whole park, but my area and any area that I'm working with, and simply with software as we're going along, if we see some opportunities to clean up not only the software, because it could, it could be a code smell, but it could be that maybe we need to refactor and talk to the, ha have an architectural effect. Maybe we need to refactor this over into a strategy, delegate this off, rather than have this big case statement. Or maybe we need to create a new type of ways of we're working with microservices and we need to evolve where we're going to really, you know, pass around a, a set of parameters and, and then having, you know, looking at what's going on with that. So how can we get these? The problem is, is if we're under the gun, how can we get these pause points? How can we get time to improve? So some, some things can help us with making that better. For example, checklists can help, quality focus checklist. Um, this is one I got from James Thorpe, uh, and he works for a, a large company in Germany. Uh, but th they had their different checklists. That, that not only with the release checklist, and, and any team I've worked with, we were checking for certain qualities, 
but also we could have during sprint planning and things like that. So this checklist, it not, only, it not only had checklists for architecture because he was actually the lead architecture at this insurance, large insurance company. But they, so they looked at certain architectural qualities and performance and security, but also they had things like code quality and, and other types of things. Maybe they were checking, can we recover and roll back if there's a problem? I used to have that as part of my teams that we would do. And I don't know why, and checklists still get used, but I don't know why so many of my software engineering friends sometimes think that we're just above or beyond, or we can just, we're clever enough, we can just keep the checklist in our minds. Uh, look at doctors and airplane pilots. They use checklists a lot, and I'm happy they do. <laughs> you know, I think they should even do more. Then even then, they still make mistakes. So what, we think we're an elite class above all this? Um, but really, here's a checklist manifesto written by Atul Gawande, and there's a picture of him. But he talked about there's really two types of checklists. One is, is we do the read and review. And so we might be going in and kind of checking different things and reviewing, does this meet the kind of quality we're looking at? Maybe we have some tools to help with that. But we also have the do and confirm. So we'll do some action, and we'll get some results, and we'll look over that. Now, obviously, these are good for enterprise, and we're having large systems, and most large companies I know have some pretty well-defined checklists. But what about small teams? Can small teams have check? Do they need checklists? Well, small teams could have checklists too. Um, in fact, in a sense, isn't a backlog kind of a checklist? Uh, in a sense, we're prioritizing, and we want to check, and where is it done? Where is it in the process, and we kind of look at, is it, has, has it been accepted yet? Um, but thanks to a, a good friend of mine from at, at Mosaic Works, uh, Alex, uh, from a company in Romania, their small team, they even have checklists for how they go through. This is a very small, lightweight, agile team doing a lot of Ruby-type development and things, but they even have checklists on how they do their daily meetings. For example, if you, if you look at their, and the team owns this. What made this very valuable is the team embraced it and took it. So they had a checklist on, uh, hey, is the feature taking too long to develop? Maybe we need to get help or split the feature out. Um, does anybody need help? Uh, it, what's the big picture? Uh, so uh, they even had checklists on how to transition from their different states, and the team evolved it. So checklists seem to have uh, higher meaning and, and a higher acceptance of adaptability or usability is if the team takes ownership for it. And so if the team can embrace it and evolve it, which means you have to constantly update it. Yes? So I mean, what about how do you encourage ownership? I haven't really kind of done that yet. I see, I see kind of this thing of where it's more like the future of responsibility where if the team's responsible, then nobody's really responsible. And things fall to the crack because of that. But if you make one person responsible, it'll get done. But then how is yeah, that's right. And that's where the team, so, so how, do you, how do you help the, the team take ownership of it? Part of that is the team has to evaluate what do we value and what's important and what should we put. So the team needs to manage the checklist and evolve it. If it's mandated and you're the boss and you give me the checklist, you're here, okay, I'm doing it. Now you're gone. Do I think it's valuable? Eh, I'll get to it later. Oh, the boss is coming. Well, let me make sure to do it. But if I own it and we as a team agree, so it's the team coming into agreement, so it's more this whole team, all of us working together and agreeing upon that, then they kind of take ownership. It's ours now. It's not, it's not being mandated to it. Yeah, there might be some things that are mandated. You're in a regulated industry, so you have to do this. And then you make the team understand, so you have communication. So they're part of that uh, education of understanding what's part of that. But mostly the team needs to kind of take ownership by and plus evolving it and updating it. We need to constantly be saying, does this add value? Is it, is it helping us? If I do things on a checklist and they're not adding value, I think I just wasted time and I'm just doing it because it's being mandated. I'll, I'll do it, but you know, pretty soon I'm, I'm not doing it so well. And you should be really focusing on the things that add value if we're going to put it on the checklist. So the team actually owned this. They made this up. And so that way, the whole, since the whole team decided on it, even if you leave the team, we decided now all of a sudden we get a new person from our team, so you come and join our team. You have input to change the checklist. Well, I see every day you say we have to. I remember for this 
one company I was working for, and I had a team of developers, and, and they were learning Agile, and Mary, I like Mary a lot. She was out in Milpitas, California, a Silicon Valley team. And she was doing a lot of development. She says, Joe, that some of this Agile stuff and the Scrum stuff we're doing is pretty cool, but like the daily stand-ups, we repeat ourselves every day. And, you know, it's just, I, I feel like I'm repeating myself, and it's a waste of time. The five minutes I'm repeating, and the five minutes Bill repeats, or the five minutes, uh, you know, Linda repeats, or whoever. And as you go, and I said, well, Mary, change it. <laughs> you can change it. It's okay. That's part of the agile mindset. That's where people get stuck in the process. So the team needed to take ownership. Maybe we decide we're going to skip a day on the stand-up. That's okay. Or maybe we decide during our stand-up, we're not going to do this repeated that five minute answering those three questions, whatever they have on the scrum, whatever, right? is maybe we're going to stand over by our board and kind of talk about things, or maybe we'll talk about the architecture some, and, and we can do other types of things. And so that's where, the, that's where the part of that agile mindset can help. But what's key, if you really want to make things better, it's important that we have slack time. If we're always under the gun, and so I'm trying, I'm trying to make sure to give you guys some slack time uh, as we went through. So remember early on when I started, I took a few minutes for you guys to think about this. So if we ever really want to make things better, we have to have ways of looking at that. So can we reduce, you know, is there some wasteful things we're doing? So there was one woman I was talking with, Stephanie, she wrote a very good experience report. I was shepherding her paper for the Agile Experience Report a few years ago, and their company went Agile about 10 years ago doing uh, uh, Scrum and TDD and all this other, pair programming and all this other stuff, but she was in QA and she didn't know, well, how do I fit into all this? And so they had to fill their own way in. And so she became part of the team and paired up. And one thing she found out is 60, when she started working with the team people, she found out that 60% of the things that she was testing was exactly the same thing the developers were testing. Now, she still needed to validate that. She could help the team do a better job and validate that. But rather than being wasteful and duplicating that, now she could spend more time uplifting those team members who were understanding testing and quality better and focusing more on some other, the other types of testing, which are also very core, that the team wasn't doing. And so she, she could still validate those tests and make sure they were good, but do that other effect. And, and, but you have to have time to do that. So if you don't have time, and if we're under the gun, you have to inject time. So some ways you, to inject time, obviously we need to monitor and make visible, because if we don't know we have a problem, how are we going to make it better? If we find wasteful things, that, and that's, this is part of the Kanban type process, and with most lean processes, you try to find if we're doing wasteful things. And you could inject time. Now, retros were supposed to be part of this, but there's some other things you can do to make things better as well. For example, um, with one team I was working on down in Brazil, and this was really cool with what one of the scrum teams decided they would do. Every day when they come in, Everybody's coming in, you're still waking up, figuring out what you're going to do. It's before your daily stand-up. You know, you're getting coffee, doing whatever. They would spend a half hour or whatever looking at the code and cleaning it up and processing that before they started the day. That's almost like doing your morning stretches before you go for a run. You get to run and you sustain it much better, and it influenced their mindset for the rest of the day. I thought that was the coolest thing. They couldn't do that at the end of the day. End of the day, it's frantic, phone calls, trying to get things done. Got to go home, meet the wife or kids. We got this other stuff going on, uh, you know, what, whatever's going on from that. And so by injecting that, there's some other ways you can inject up this into Slack time. Uh, for example, you might having some coding. They, they were having uh, once a month, they could have a few hours of a coding dojo where everybody's working on refactoring part of the system and cleaning up or do an experiment with the architecture, and then they could decide if it goes into the next sprint. So there's some ways we can inject slack time, and if we don't have that, you can never improve. You need to be able to have some experiments. We might find an order of magnitude better way of doing the same thing. That's how these very innovative companies do that. And all of us, whether you're an insurance company, banking, whatever, we're all in technology now. That was one thing I, I heard. Uh, I was talking with Gregor Hopi a couple years ago when he, was, he gave a, in Baltimore as well. He, he gave a keynote there. But we were, we were talking about that. We're all technology. You know, everybody's becoming te technology, so you better think about ways of in innovating. So I, I'm really, really hoping that I get the thumbs up with these ideas from, from, from Slack time because I think it's an important pr principle. It fits into even like 
Kaizen, because Kaizen was really focused on, literally, if you look at Kaizen, any improvement can be Kaizen. If you look at kind of the definition, depending on how they talk about it. Though most people view it as continuous improvement. And, and how do we continually kind of learn and evolve? And so anybody, any art, like my chef friend, he's always experimenting. I, I'm sure that, uh, Bill, as, as you're doing music, you're always experimenting and trying new things. But you need to take time to do that. And then you could put that back in. And if we don't allow time for that, things are never going to get better. So here I have uh, retrospectives are key. But notice I have Vegas on there. So the, the scary side, and this is almost like a double-edged sword, is what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Well, what happens in the retrospective stays in the retrospective. So on one hand, I want people need to feel safe. I can come and I can share whatever, and I'm not going to get in trouble for talking about issues, and we need to have this community of trust. That's part of that agile mindset. On the other hand, what I, unfortunately, what a lot of times what I see happens in retrospectives is those principles never get applied. And it's very important that small steps are taken as we evolve to, to make things to, to, to go further as, as we evolve from the system from this. So it's important that we take small steps. And it shouldn't be blaming, and it shouldn't be talking... It shouldn't just turn into a bitch session where we're just talking about things we don't like. Or, or well, only if, if DevOps was different, or only if the DBA and, you know, things we don't have power over, we can bring up and maybe have a strategy to communicate with them or bring them in as part of the retrospective. But we really should focus and be very concrete. What can I do? What can I do over the next couple of sprints for doing this? And, and in fact, Spotify, I was fortunate enough uh, to also, one of the things I really like shepherding some of the experience reports at a lot of the conferences is I met Woody Zoll, sort of the mob programming guy, a few years ago. And, and I asked Woody, what is the core principle of what you're really trying to teach uh, with, with this paper? What do you want people to get out of your paper, to do mob programming? And he said, no, the most important thing is, is we stumbled onto it accidentally, but it was, and it was very successful to the company to the point where they have many mob teams now <laughs> and, and developing software very nicely with it was mostly to learn, constantly learn in retrospect and learn that. And even Spotify talks about that. And so I got to meet Woody because I was over in, in, in Poland at a conference and he was up in, in Stockholm visiting uh, Spotify and HLM uh, for talking about some mobbing things. And I said, Woody, we became friend, Skype friends, but I wanted to meet him in person. So I, and I had a friend in Stockholm, so I flew there and we met and we went to Spotify. And, and when I went to Spotify, it was kind of cool because Spotify had things visible and open a lot of the time. And one thing Spotify really talked about is they had kind of this, you know, they have their squad and tribes and all the different ways they do that, but they're constantly trying to innovate and think about the things. So they have this thing about think it, build it, ship it, and tweak it. But one, one thing that they really point about is if you tweak it, you can tweak so far, but you might, I don't know if you could see this, but you, you might be micro-optimizing. Sometimes we need to rethink, is there even a much better way of doing the architecture, or even the way we're doing our process. And so there's some things that can really make things much better if we... Do. Sometimes we have to stop, experiment, completely rethink it, and, and try it and with these little experiments, and it might come up with a much better way. And if it doesn't, we just discard that, and we, we try to learn. And, and so that was a key thing. So there's some regular practices that we can get in to, to, to make things better. And if we value, if we value these... So, so it, it depends on what we value with that. So I want to make sure to, if we had a little more time, I'd even take a longer pause point to have you guys do some more interactive things. But get, given our time, I don't think I quite have a long pause point I can take right now. But I, I do want to at least end up with some different practices that I have found from software architecture and from quality. And, and I've been doing a lot of work as being agile at quality, and I call it QA to AQ. <laughs> and it's not that QA is going away, but, uh, but, but something that I've noticed, it's been almost tragic in a way, is in the software industry, at least not all the time, but in a lot of areas I've seen in the software industry, it's almost tragic that a lot of QA has devolved to something that I would call QC, quality control. So in my past life, when I was a very young guy, I used to work in manufacturing, and I was working at a factory, and I was working in quality uh, QA and part of that. 
And we embedded quality through the whole process. So it wasn't just the gate. Quality control was still important, the gatekeepers. But QA was more part of that. But so if you really want quality, we have to embed it all the way through the process. And so it's OK to be agile and still think about architecture and qualities. And it was almost like what Ke Kevlin H Henning talked about yesterday is you don't wait till the last possible moment to do some of these things. And, and unfortunately, a lot of agile people get stuck with that. You have to really build quality into your project rhythms. And it's like this, I like this quote from Aristotle, quality is not an act, it's a habit. So if I want to be quality, whatever I do, I need to practice and make it a regular practice. You know, if I want to be a quality runner, if I want to be, a, you know, quality software engineer, a quality musician or a chef, you know, they're always experimenting and get into that practice. And so some decisions are too important to leave until the last responsible moment which you usually hear a lot in the Agile mindset. So one thing that we've been pushing is choose the most responsible moment. Some things are so important, and so maybe even on the roadmap, when we're planning the roadmap, there are certain architectural risks that need to be addressed, and we know we need a certain amount there before we address it, but we, we plan on the roadmap when we want to think about certain types of things. And so you can even, this is one that, we made up because most of, my, most of uh, my clients I have NDAs with, I can't really share any of their roadmaps. So I worked with one with Rebecca because we kind of did a, uh, a talk about, we've been writing a lot of patterns on this, me and Rebecca Wurstbrock. But you could kind of think about, well, maybe we're going to be looking at microservices and we want to do a little bit of spike solution experiment or looking about some of this uh, platform stability or something with the, we, we want to go to big data, but we want to also experiment with security and reliability at certain points. And we want to, we, we can plan on a roadmap, where should we think about that? So when you're being agile, you have a roadmap, so we can start thinking, but being agile, we know we might change the roadmap. And we might even try some experiments and merge back in. So this experiment didn't work, but this one did. Or based upon these two, they teach us something new to try uh, another variation. And ultimately, these can even be put on your backlog. Uh, you can add quality-related architectural work. That's okay. But that means we need a relationship with the architect, the QA people, with the product owners. Because usually the product owner is the one who owns the backlog. You know, they're like God. You know, and a lot of agile type of things from that. And, and in fact, Philip Crutchin has talked about ways that you can even colorize your backlog. Uh, so that way you make it visible to the team. That was one cool thing that when I went into Spotify, I immediately saw once I walked into the big Spotify area in Stockholm with their main headquarters and I started going into the developers areas, and then all their tribes, they kind of had big open space, but then they had ways of this webbing type thing that they can break off their spaces but be very agile for adapting, <coughs> excuse me, and growing their spaces. But what, Sp what Spotify had is, when, as, when I, as soon as I went in there, there was a lot of things visible telling me what was going on. I started seeing the tweets live tweets that we're putting up for people using the system. If I saw certain qualities going on and I'm the engineer working on that, that might influence me to know about that. I even went to a, a, a large company, the equivalent of Avon in Brazil. Uh, the, uh, but when I went in there, you know, I instantly, they had all this operational information, live feeds and other stuff kind of going on around to all the development teams. So it made this visible to me. And, and I think being visible is very important from that, because then it can influence what's going on. Because what I don't know about, you know, if, if it's hidden from me, or if there's this us and them, or maybe it's not even being hidden, it's just not visible, it doesn't get addressed. So we can find some ways of addressing this. And Philip Crutchin talks about one way. There's a lot of ways of doing this. Agile says find the way that works for you, you know, for your team. And there's a lot of ways, too, that we talk about on uh, finding and describing qualities. Um, Agile teams can, uh, one way we looked at, which since I'm here at Saturn, is uh, we, we have something that we adapted uh, fr from the SEI for describing quality attributes, but more in a, a lighter weight way that w we've used and adapted and worked with some, with some of our clients where you, you can have quality scenarios or stories or fold out qualities. Uh, you know, I won't spend too much time going through these, but these are some lightweight things that I've documented well online with some examples of. Uh, where you can have ways of describing some of your different qualities. And even, you can even think of attaching fold-out qualities to user stories. So if these are important types of 
qualities or important attributes or things that you think from an architectural perspective that should be looked at. You can think like, like for security. As a when you, to really be, have this user story finished, there's a lot of other hidden qualities that aren't part of it. Security, uh, how do we have control of it? How can we cancel an order? How, what if there's a lots of users? But ultimately, if we're going to attach these to user stories, we need to tell the team, the development team, how can they validate that it's working? Well, order time has to be less than two seconds. Maybe you need to say with this type of performance. So you can think of even attaching to your different user stories these things. And you could even think of a, this is a well-known agile so-called process, right? Which I'll leave unnamed. <laughs> Uh, but you can even think of, of, of including some things in, in, in thinking about are there architectural risk or key quality things or uh, when you're doing your product envisioning phase. And even when you're going through and developing and managing the backlog, you can put some quality stories or quality attributes or scenarios with that. And then when you plan a sprint, it might have some quality related tasks that has to be implemented because really when you want acceptability, it really means finalizing not only the functional acceptance tested, but does it meet these different types of quality attributes? So we can even include that to one of these unnamed kind of so-called agile processes that are considered, you know, probably the most common used agile process with that. And even TDD gives you ways of thinking about that. Well, even when you're refactoring, you can still think about making things better. So as we're evolving here, there are a lot of ongoing quality activities that can help us, such as making things visible, it's very important visibility, but vis visibility can be done a lot of ways. So one is obviously we can start posting different things. We can have some different operational things. We can make them visible with this uh, w w through, through our backlog as well to the team. Um, you know, that, that can help a, a lot. But there's some other ways of doing this um, that the team might take ownership with. And so, so for example, I've worked with a couple of these guys here, one of them you might recognize is pa pa Paulo Merson here, as well as Eduardo Guerra and uh, Adamar Aguilar. Uh, but we put together, but, but I, I, I need to make sure to attribute that most of the work is based upon what Paulo has done. He, I, I ended up being a co-author, but he's done the, really the hard work with, uh, on this thing. Uh, out of all four of us, I would say most of it I would attribute to, to, to Paulo. But this is where we can really, when we're looking at continuous inspection, we might look at for some different types of architectural conformance. And I think Paulo is probably going to give a talk about this tomorrow. Are you going to? Yeah, so to go to Paulo if you want to know a lot of the details. But really what it is, is, is as you're going through and you have the running software and you're analyzing the source code and giving feedback to developers, but not only to developers, to the architects as well. Because it could be that sometimes the reason people aren't using your, maybe you have a package that you've isolated, you want to protect for security reasons, SQL injection, so you must use our DB layer. And you find out a lot of developers aren't using that. So I always, I've never really looked at it so much as being the architectural police, though may, maybe Paulo looks at it more that way. But it's really like, let's get feedback. It could be the new developers don't know that we have this nice package over here, and they're, you're using it improperly. It could be, though, that, the, that our architecture needs to be, it needs to change, needs to be refactored to do that. And we need that kind of feedback as well. And so you may have some architectural triggers that can, that can help you with that, that can help you reevaluate that. So if we're being agile, you want to periodically evaluate your architecture and really think about what makes this. And, and, and you go through this evolution. So part of being agile in architecture is agile values can still drive your architectural practices. So as we're doing that, being agile, the main thing about being agile is we don't overthink things. We don't get stuck. We try experiments. We try to learn. It's okay to still think about architecture, but do something. Improve it and refine it. Improve your architectural ideas. Re reduce risk. Make it testable. Prototype. Uh, incrementally refine and defer, defer any architectural decisions we can to the most responsible moment, not the last possible moment, because we can still implement the last possible. So just to summarize, we wrote a lot of patterns on this, me and Rebecca and Eduardo, on doing this. I'll just kind of give you the big pictures of this. If, if you, some of these were for Asian Plop in Japan a couple years ago, and then last year, or a couple years ago in, in the US for Plop. 
as well. But we, we, we talked about a lot of, uh, when you're doing agile architectures, we're, we're ultimately wanting to evolve a pattern language for when you're thinking about this as you're being agile and you're still evolving your architecture. So uh, I definitely have all these papers available. If anybody, if you Google them, you'll be able to find it. Or if you get a hold of me, uh, just send me email or any kind of message, I'll give it to you. As well as we, me and Rebecca has written up a ton of these patterns for being agile at quality, uh, which you can find off of our websites as well. And so I, I mentioned a few of them as I, during this talk, but there's a whole bunch on there. We, ultimate, our original paper was QA to AQ, patterns for transitioning, but it's, but it's even, these are, some of these make good sense whether you're transitioning, whether you're being agile or not. It, it, it doesn't really matter. So let me kind of leave you with this, is where do you start? Well, I think, first of all, you should start by making things visible and, and understanding where your pain is. You know, one, one thing I, I, it's understanding what, what are the important features, how are we going? I, I appreciated, you know, hearing Chris this morning in the keynote kind of talking about uh, some of these, uh, what are the important illities that come up? And, you know, and I ta started out talking about some of that. Small, quick releases are one way of doing that. In fact, we saw you can satisfy some of those illities we heard this morning with microservices. Oh, there's trade-offs with doing some of that, and you have a certain amount of complexity. Pick some low-hanging fruit. Uh, try some things. Um, and, and the main thing is the team has to own it. So what do you value? So let's, let's find out what do you value in your own life, and let's come to team values, and let's, map it, and let's make it visible so that we want the business side to understand the, the technical side value and vice versa, and the organization has values. But let's, the team should have its own set of values and communicate them and be open about it and make it explicit, make it visible. Uh, and it de a lot depends upon where, where your pain is. So how much architectural risk do you have? Uh, it, you know, it, it, if the risk, the more risk, the more pain. So if, if you have a small project, usually the architecture can evolve okay without too much of attention. But if you're in very large product projects, you can have a lot of challenges. By the way, there are some indicators that you've done a good job. And so I want to at least leave you with a few of these before I finish. Usually if your defects are localized, stable interfaces is pretty consistent. People aren't afraid, oh, we have to add this new feature. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm on vacation next week. <laughs> or I'm going to be sick when that, I don't want to touch that piece of code. Because <laughs> every time I touch it, it breaks another part of the system. We know that's a problem. If, but if that doesn't happen, you know you've done a pretty good job. Uh, and we're, so if people aren't avoiding the working and, and you can add new features. By the way, I can't help but say too, is Steve McConnell also talks about, there's a lot of other ways for thinking about improving quality. Now I'm not sure, th this is very interesting and I have the reference and obviously the slides are gonna be available. But he talks about uh, techniques for improving quality and he had looked in industry a lot of things. I don't know if Steve McConnell looks at unit testing the way that I can, I don't know if you can read that, but if you really look at that, it talks about uh, different ways of how to find bugs in your code and, and ensure that you have different quality techniques. And he shows that no single technique gives you really more than 75% by itself. And, and in fact, the average is around 40. He has unit tests around 30, but I don't know if he means unit tests the same way I think about unit tests. So I was happy to hear Kelvin talk about getting up to 77% with unit tests. That's a different kind of thinking with that. But what he really shows is, if you pick a few of these, you can really get up to 90%. And so the main thing is do whatever adds the most value. Combining techniques, and that's where the team decides, well, let's try a little bit of unit tests, but maybe there's some pairing, so that's sharing some of the code, more of informal code reviews, plus some more, I always call this the Microsoft way, high volume beta tests. Let's just get a lot of you guys to test it for us in the ser first service pack release. Kind of has it working with that. So values drive your practice. I talked about visibility being number one. Small releases are good, keeping things clean as we go. But get into some good daily practices. And that's where the team has to decide what are some good practices that can help. I mean, what's key here is we need some slack time, which I didn't give you too much today. I gave you a little bit. But it's slack time to really think and think about how we can improve. Because we want to sustain it. So I started off with the, I want to finish with this, the Manifesto for Agile Software Development we all kind of know, right? Well, I've been working with a friend and we've kind of come up with something new. We call it the Lazy Manifesto. 
Maybe we're thinking the, some of the best programmers I know are the lazy programmers. They find, you know, where they can do the same for one-tenth of the amount of time. <laughs> so maybe we should rewrite the manifesto, keeping slack over being busy all the time. In fact, this was done originally. I got the ideas from a good friend of mine, Kirosan from Japan, who's really pushing a lot of these agile principles over in Japan. And I, I kind of call it the relaxed. We need breathing time so we can experiment. Sometimes we want to do less to deliver the same, doing only what is necessary. And of course, since Agile Manifesto and the Agile people have their 12 principles, we want our principles as well. By the way, doing nothing is always an option. And I shouldn't be afraid of eliminating my own job. You know, that, that might add value. So, so when, we're, when we're thinking really of the Agile mindset, there's a difference between being versus doing. So when I, a lot of time when you first learn something, you teach me you're the master. I just blindly follow what you tell me. When I do something, there's one single truth. You're, the, you're, the, you're my master. You taught me. You know the truth. But ultimately, we have to incorporate. There might be multiple truths, and I have to find what works best for me. So that's more of the agile mindset. It's really trying to adapt. And so, uh, see, when you really look, at, sometimes people say, you're not, being, you're not doing TDD because you didn't write your test exactly first. So that's being very inflexible. Pragmatic, more, so I say take, it's more idealistic or realistic, that's more agile, is really we should find the balance. What works for you? So when I transition and I'm going from the way I, uh, I'm first learning something, I learn it by the book, you know, the shu ha ri, the ha, now I need to incorporate it and learn what, how I can do it, and then the re, ultimately, I kind of move beyond it. So being pragmatic, let's balance. We don't want too much up front, but no planning isn't good. Sometimes people call that agile. Hey, I can just do whatever. So it's a journey. So, oh, I'll just say follow through. Slack time is important, paying attention, and continuous learning. I gave you a, a few takeaways. Your values are important. Code quality and delivery size. I have a lot of links on here. It's definitely been my uh, pleasure coming here once again to Saturn and being part of this. Uh, I wish I had a little more slack time for some interaction, but I definitely have slack time because I will be doing the office hours right after this as well as tomorrow. So if anybody would like to come and challenge me or if you have good ideas, especially about how to draw microservices architecture picture or whatever, please do that. So anyway, thank you very much.